Well, welcome to the president's address to the community and a start of a brand new academic year. I think we could not have conjured up better weather this week to welcome our new students and parents, returning students, and of course all of us here today. My name is Jeremy Hafner and I'm Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at RIT. As we begin today's event, please join me and stand for the singing of the national anthem, followed by the singing of our alma mater. Keith Jenkins, associate professor in the Department of Communications in the College of Liberal Arts, will lead us in the singing, accompanied by Thatcher Lyman, a doctoral student in organ performance at the Eastman School of Music. What so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Keith. Last year, those of you who attended the president's remarks uh, might have heard me say, uh, call Keith the associate provost. I inadvertently introduced him as that. Um, of course, that was associate provost for singing of the national anthem. Uh, and I, but the cost containment results, uh, we chose not to uh, give him that promotion this year. I also want to thank Thatcher uh, Thatcher, your presence here and the beautiful music you played um, certainly reminds me of one of my favorite childhood fables about a, a brave little yellow jacket who flew into a jungle of tigers. So, thank you for being there. 
At this point in time, I'd like you to join me in a warm RIT welcome of the members of the Board of Trustees who are with us today and who have joined us online as we stream this event. Let's thank our Board of Trustees for their vision and planning. And of course, our ceremony, like other ceremonies, is deeply enriched by the presence and expertise of our professional sign language interpreters and real-time captionists. We thank them for their important work in facilitating access to communication here at RIT. Let's give them a round of applause, too. Now, the transition to semesters is clearly turned a corner here at RIT. Uh, and as I was looking over my notes last night, I was wanting to really find a pithy quote about change that would impress the faculty and inspire the staff. So I did what everyone would do, and that would be go to Google and type in pithy quote to impress staff and impress faculty. Um, I was disappointed I didn't find a pithy quote that would really impress the faculty and inspire the staff, but I found three quotes that are least likely to <laughs> impress the faculty and inspire the staff, and I thought I'd share those with you. So really quickly, number three, number three. May the bridges I burn light the way. Number two, a year from now, you will wish you had started today. <laughs> now, whoever said that clearly didn't meet Dr. Dessler because a year from now, that's way too late. He wanted a year ago, so. Quote number one, least likely to inspire. Sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. Now, you might ask, who said that last line? Well, that last line was Marilyn Monroe. There you go. Uh, an inspiring person in our history, if there ever was one. <laughs> well, uh, all, all kidding aside, it has been a long and sometimes difficult journey, but through your tremendous efforts, I am fully confident that we are ready, and I am filled with excitement to take this baby, this new academic calendar, out for a spin. But those words really do not do justice to the work that has been done. So I, I want to pause here and marvel at the tremendous effort that you all have put forward to get us to, the, to this day. Yes, we will have a very nice celebration next week, but with all due respect, this celebration should continue for weeks to come. The deans and I had a chance to marvel at the work that you all have done earlier in the summer at our annual retreat when we looked at an array of impressive data and numbers. And here's just a little bit that we started with. 10,352. That's the number of individual advising plans that were crafted by our professional advising staff and staff assistants and faculty across campus for our returning students, 10,352. 222, that's the number of programs that were sent and approved and registered at New York State Department of Education as a result of the calendar conversion process. That's the work of faculty and staff all over the campus to get our programs ready to admit students and get them registered for this fall. And 2,951 semester courses were uploaded into SIS for the fall semester. That's just amazing. That's just amazing. But it doesn't stop there, okay? Because that's just the calendar conversion. The campus didn't stop along the way. The faculty 
continued to deliver quality teaching and work on their research. The staff continued to help students do what they needed to do to graduate. For example, faculty submitted 713 research proposals in 2012-2013. That's a record number for RIT at a time when we were in the midst of the final year of our pre-conversion process. And the staff, the staff continued to make sure that we retained our students. Our first year persistent rates rose again as it had done in the past four years to 89%. And everyone, everyone worked to continue to make our graduation placement rate to be a best-in-class performance, a whopping 95% of our graduating students either got a job or went on to the graduate school of their choice. Congratulations, RIT. But not all the numbers that the deans and I looked at were about the institution. In fact, we spent most of the time looking at numbers about you. You will recall that last year you took time from your busy schedules to complete the climate and engagement survey administered to faculty and staff. And faculty took time to complete the coach survey that was administered to full-time tenured and non-tenured track faculty. By the way, 56% of the faculty filled out that coach survey. That was a record uh, number of returned responses for the coach survey. Thanks to all of you who completed those surveys. Uh, I know that when I get a survey, I, I certainly give Senka thought about whether or not I want to complete them because of the time that it takes to do them. But I want to emphasize how important and how dedicated we are to looking at the data and discerning what you're telling us about your job satisfaction. Through your feedback, we are able to aff affirm our core strengths, but also to identify opportunities for improvement at this university. I assure you that we have been immersed in the data and will spend considerable time during the next academic year in seeking your input and advice as to how we can celebrate the successes and make improvements in these areas of opportunity. The results of the survey shared common themes, and I just want to spend a few minutes talking about them very briefly. Our strengths come really as no surprise. Personal and family policies, health and, retire and retirement benefits, and departmental collegiality. The data also indicates areas where we are demonstrating relative strength, such as tenure reasonableness, pre-tenure mentoring, departmental engagement, and the nature of a faculty member's work related to service. But we won't kid ourselves either. The findings also make it clear that we have room for improvement in the areas of university promotion and tenure policy, mentoring of our tenured faculty, and finding more ways and opportunities to appreciate and acknowledge and recognize our hardworking faculty and staff. Having held excellent discussions with the deans, our next steps are to widely share the results of and lead discussions about the surveys across campus during the coming months. But to be unequivocally clear, the deans and I are not only committed, but we are eager in making material progress on addressing the issues and concerns that faculty and staff have shared in these surveys. In particular, our initial focus will be on the areas of improvement, increasing support for promotion and post-tenure faculty, providing tenure policy clarity, and stepping up appreciation and recognition of our faculty and staff. We will also look at other identified issues and develop action plans later on in the academic year. To guide our communication and to facilitate further study in these areas specifically identified through the COACH survey, I have formed an Advancing Faculty and Staff Success Task Force. Now, this task force is co-chaired by Lynn Wild, Associate Provost for Faculty Development, and Maureen Valentine, Associate Dean in CAST and the co-PI on, on the advance grant. The task force will lead presentations with me in town hall meetings, and with chairs and directors across campus, 
and facilitate focus groups that we can delve deeper to get a better understanding of the concerns expressed by faculty and staff. As a university, we are always moving forward and striving to improve and innovate with our students and programs and coursework. But as an organization, we strive to improve the way in which we interact with each other and function as a whole. And I can tell you right now that I genuinely look forward to making advancing faculty and staff success a key focus for our work in the academic affairs this next year. Now, earlier this week at the Convocation for New Students and Families, a series of speakers including Dr. Dessler, Dr. Boyce Pardee, Dr. Paul Dara, and I pledged to parents that their students have made the right choice by selecting RIT. We pledge to our incoming students that RIT is committed to providing them, as we all have come to appreciate, an outstanding educational experience both inside and outside the classroom. Our first step in delivering on these pledges begins with this morning's speakers, the chairs of the Academic Senate and Staff Council, and the President of Student Government will each have about five minutes to welcome you and briefly outline their vision and plans for the upcoming year. And when they are finished, Dr. Dessler will deliver his President's address. Now, Kevin McDonald, our Vice President and Associate Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and a regular speaker at this event, is unable to be here today due to family obligations. Uh, and in his presence, he asked me to share four points uh, that he wanted to let the community know will be occurring throughout this next academic year. First, we're very pleased to welcome Tavis Smiley as our Expressions of Kings Legacy Speaker this year. In addition to participating in the Liberty Hill Speaker Series and delivering a keynote address to the Rochester and RIT communities, Tavis will moderate a panel discussion in the city regarding the state of race in Rochester 50 years after the riots of 1964. I'm sure you will find it a very stimulating uh, and moving uh, presentation, and I hope that you will save that date on your calendars. More will be announced later on. Second, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is partnering with Jim Myers, the Associate Provost for International Education and Global Programs, to offer inclusive grants this fall. The purpose of these grants is to provide one-time funding for faculty and staff to strengthen teaching, pedagogical practices, student development programs, and research with diversity implications. And again, a formal announcement will be forthcoming later this fall. Third, the Division of Diversity and Inclusion is partnering with the Department of Communications, Dale Carnegie, Adrian Jules Custom Clothiers, Action for a Better Community, the American Heart Association, and the Wegmans Human Resources Department for a new initiative aimed at undergraduate men of color at RIT. The, initi the initiative is called, and I love this acronym, MOCA, Men of Color, Honor, and Ambition. And MOCA's inaugural class of students will begin this October. Fourth and finally, with the support of the Office of the President, the Office of the Provost, the Division of Finance and Administration, the Division of Diversity and Inclusion, and the Division of Student Affairs, we are very proud that RIT will have a new, dedicated, multicultural space for its students this fall. The Division of Diversity and Inclusion and the Division of Student Affairs are working collaboratively with student organizations on this effort, and a grand opening is expected later in the fall. I join Kevin in agreeing that it's going to be a very exciting year, and you all can watch for more details on each of these initiatives as the year progresses. And now I am very pleased to introduce our very first speaker this morning, Dr. Michael Labor, Chair of the Academic Senate and Associate Professor of History in the College of Liberal Arts. Dr. Labor, who many of you know is a glutton for hard work, especially for the hard work that lies ahead in the Academic Senate, was just tenured and promoted to associate professor just last year. So congratulations, Michael. Give a warm welcome to Michael Label. Oh. Um, hello? 
well, they're not going to like that, but um, yeah, okay, then. all right. Well, apparently, Academic Senate is going to be investigating the feasibility of changing from semesters to quarters, so uh, <laughs> don't kill the messenger. So just kidding, just kidding, little joke to start off the presentation. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, it is my great privilege and my great honor to serve this year as the chair of Academic Senate alongside my colleagues, representatives of which come from every segment of RIT, students, staff, faculty, and administration. In fact, rather than talk about what specific items of business the Senate will take up this year, and no doubt you'll hear no end of that in the months ahead, tenure policy, uh, resource allocation, and budget reports, uh, I'd like to spend a couple minutes thinking about the university not as a collection of individuals, but as a single community, a community that is reflected in the very representative nature of the Academic Senate. I believe that the academic community is meant first and foremost to serve our students through teaching, mentoring, through friendship, and through leading by example. But the university, as we all know, is much more than that. It is a place where the life of the mind is celebrated and encouraged through world-class research and teaching. It is a place where the future is literally fostered in the ideas and the knowledge that we share amongst ourselves and in part to our students. And it is a place where our faculty and staff dare to dream unthought ideas, dare to create art that challenges our beliefs and our reality, and challenges colleagues and students to think in new ways to tackle old and enduring problems in new ways. All of this is not just pie in the sky rhetoric. It happens every day in the studios, the labs, and the classrooms across our university. And it is all made possible not just by the brilliant minds that call RIT home, but also by the community that we celebrate in today's convocation. The academic support staff, the staff that cleans our hallways and serves our food, the faculty who pour out their hearts and souls into their teaching, and yes, even the administration, all make possible the amazing educational experience that our students receive and the amazing life of the mind that each and every one of us participates in every day. So in closing, I am here to assure you that whoever you are and whatever your position at this great university, your contribution matters even if your contribution is a kind word or a warm smile to students far from home and facing an uncertain future. I also want to assure you that your concerns and the issues that are most important to you are important to your senators. These concerns are real, and many of them are daunting and sometimes fraught with disagreements. But I believe that it is only in community with respect and dignity to everyone that these issues will be resolved. I can promise you that this is what your academic senate at RIT will strive for, and in the end, together, I have no doubt that we will meet whatever challenges and opportunities this year holds. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Julia Lasuzo, Chair of Staff Council and Director of Financial Operations in the Wallace Center. Julia. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the start of an extraordinary academic year in the history of RIT. Conversion is maybe not complete, but almost complete. And today we begin the first RIT semester ever. As we begin this year, I want to acknowledge the hard work of all the staff, as well as the faculty and administration that made this conversion possible. Thank you all for your hard work. Last year when I stood here, I acknowledged that RIT had made the Chronicle of Higher Education's list of great colleges to work for. I still believe that RIT is a great college to work for. It's my firm belief that what makes us great is the collegiality of the staff and faculty who work here. None of us can do our job in a vacuum, and it is so refreshing to have colleagues who go above and beyond 
in assisting each other in the jobs they do. I have the opportunity in my job to work with staff from many departments and divisions across campus. Overwhelmingly, my interactions with these individuals are pleasant and helpful. I believe that the staff and faculty at RIT are among the most cooperative and friendly people that I've ever worked with, and I appreciate that on a daily basis. I am confident that with such a strong and competent staff collaborating with each other, we have the power to place RIT on the Chronicles list in many categories. This past year, Human Resources and the Office for Diversity and Inclusion released the results of the Employee Engagement and Climate Survey that was taken by RIT employees in the spring of 2012. While RIT fared well in comparison with our near-peer schools, we fell shy of best-in-class norms for those institutions. In an era of cost containment and doing more with less, there are ways that we can engage and encourage staff who have overwhelming workloads. Staff morale is so important to productivity and plays a large part in student retention. In an article published in the Harvard Business Review in May 2005, Richard Tanner Pascal and Jerry Sternen said, somewhere in your organization, groups of people are already doing things differently and better. To create lasting change, find these areas of positive deviance and fan their flames. I believe that RIT Staff Council is in a position to help human resources identify units on campus who achieved a best-in-class performance in categories such as organizational effectiveness, coworker performance and satisfaction, supervisor and management, recognition and career advancement, and overall sat satisfaction and employee engagement. We endeavor to understand and implement your best practices campus-wide. Consistent application of best practice policies across departments and divisions can be a simple yet great catalyst for positive staff morale. In turn, this will improve our rank in many of the Chronicles categories, including leadership, professional and career development, job satisfaction, and respect and appreciation. In addition to identifying best practices, other topics on Staff Council's plan of work this year include meeting with the Assistant Vice President for Human Resources to discuss the criteria for standardization of job titles, to look at issues like compression of staff salaries and transparency of market data used in determining wage grades during the project they conducted last year. Improvements in these areas will solidify our position on the Chronicles list with regard to compensation and benefits. We will also continue our conversations about training for both managers and individual contributors, especially for topics such as self-advocacy for staff. These efforts will improve professionalism and career development programs at the university, which is a benefit to everyone who works here. We will offer and explore opportunities for staff to contribute to cost containment, leading to a strong placement in some of the Chronicle's leadership categories. Finally, we will look at work environment issues, specifically doing post-conversion pulse checks with staff, working with the parking and transportation office on issues regarding some walkways and crosswalks that may need attention, and bringing conversations with administration about facilities that require updating. In closing, there are many more items on our plan of work for the RIT Staff Council this year, but our number one priority is to help the administration make this an even greater place to work for now and to set us up for excellence well into the future. In understanding what's important to the people at RIT, all the rest should follow. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Paul Dara, President of RIT Student Government. Paul? Thank you. 
Thank you, Julia, and good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you guys are all as excited as we are in student government about the semester conversion. And I'd like to thank Dr. Dessler for inviting us here today. From the perspective of student government, our theme, groundbreaking, encompasses everything that RIT is this year. <clears throat> Though you may see the word and think about physical groundbreaking, like for our new hockey arena. But for, student, but for student government, groundbreaking triggers thoughts about RIT's preparation for a foundational quake to our academic calendar. And it begs us to consider the ways we can contribute to the conversation and construction of this new system. This unique moment at RIT gives student government and the entire RIT community the opportunity to lay new groundwork. We may break new ground on the way we create and maintain campus traditions and explore new activities and opportunities that a semester calendar will better support. Our theme is simple, groundbreaking, and we invite you all to adopt, support, and embrace it with us. I realize that converting, converting two semesters has already created a lot of change on campus. And in student government, we have taken this moment to reflect on our own and see how we can improve, both internally and externally, so that we may expand our presence as a unified, supportive, and even stronger arm of the university government's structure. We are preparing to handle all that is expected this year to come with uh, the year's changes and even more that we think that might come that are unexpected. We hope that you'll join us in using this year to create new traditions and test innovative ideas to make our campus a better place. Our vision for the year also includes the recognition of groundbreaking opportunities for bridging gaps that sometimes exist between students and administrators. In years past, student government has invited administrators to shadow students and assigned many of you to live in spaces in the residence halls. <clears throat> this year, we will be reintroducing you to Student Speak Up Day. Imagine a day devoted to gathering all of our campus departments together along the quarter mile or the Gordon Field House for the sole purpose of seeking feedback from any and all students. Reaching out to students in a place that they call home on campus will break ground for all of us looking to develop even stronger relationships between faculty, staff, and students. With this goal in mind, student government promises to remain an open-minded communicator between our students, partners, and champions. We will be assuming responsibilities for networking and connecting people to ensure that everyone's perspective is considered, relayed, and responded to appropriately. We as an, as an organization are so excited to work with all of you. We strive every day from, to form a personal bond with each and every one of you. We look forward to working with you to better the student experience as well as all <clears throat> continue our journey towards becoming the most engaged campus in the country. Our request from each of you is that no matter your position or your level of interaction with students, that it remains a key factor in any decision you make. Why? Because, our, because of our students' energy, ideas, and motivation are what make us all so proud to say that we work, study, and graduate from RIT. Thank you all for your support. I'm excited for this groundbreaking year. Thank you, Paul. The students know Paul as Tall Paul. I can't figure out how he got that name. We do very much appreciate your exciting plans for the next academic year, and I, and I know that all of us here at RIT, the faculty and staff, 
are excited to work with you and uh, to make you successful and your student government as well. Before turning the podium over to Dr. Dessler, we have another wonderful short video to share with you. This is the eighth video in a series that I started a couple of years ago. Uh, each video focuses on how faculty influence our students and how our students appreciate the work that the faculty are doing through mentoring them and providing them opportunities to dig deeper in their interests and by sharing their knowledge and time and talents. This video this morning features Amy Lucero, a biomedical science major from the College of Health Sciences and Technology. Please enjoy the video. Hi, my name's Amy and I'm from El Rito, New Mexico. When I was little, I was always fascinated with catching bugs and examining them. My love of biology continued through high school and brought me to the NTID Science Fair at RIT. During that visit, I learned about RIT's health and science majors, its great deaf services, and its diverse culture. I realized that this would be the perfect college for me, and that's why I'm a biomedical science major here at RIT. Biomedical sciences gives you a strong foundation in math and science to prepare you for a wide range of medical careers. It's definitely put me on the right track to med school where I want to fulfill my dream of becoming a doctor. The professors are so enthusiastic and they really make the program exciting. Bill Brewer and Michelle Lennox were my professors for anatomy and physiology. Bill Brewer taught the lecture where you learn about how every part of the body works together. He was really passionate about his teaching and he would bring his personal experiences into the class all the time. Michelle Lennox taught the lab where we got to experience working with all the body parts and organs. She really focused on helping us understand how everything functions together. I think it's incredible how doing hands-on stuff really helps you understand and visualize the concepts. Another fantastic professor is Dr. Perry. She shows up every day so excited to teach. Dr. Perry is one of those professors that really tries to push students to do more than they think they can. In her human development class, I wrote a paper on ALS. ALS is one of the most common motor neuron diseases. It's an illness that progressively shuts down all the cells that manage voluntary muscle control. It was fascinating researching all of this information. It helped me see the complete picture of ALS and what the patients are going through. Professors like Dr. Perry pushed me to be more comfortable with myself. They have helped me connect the different aspects of who I am with what I am passionate about. I'm starting to realize how becoming a doctor is more than just helping people. It makes me a role model for future generations of the deaf community. I hope you like that video. Uh, I just wish we could do a video for every student uh, that comes to RIT because every student has a wonderful story to tell about some faculty member or some staff member that has deeply touched their lives. I want to give a call out, shout out, of course, to Joe Bellavio and the RIT Production Services in the Wallace Center for creating and producing these videos. And if you're interested in seeing the other videos in the series, you can find them on the Academic Affairs website just click hear from our students. And now, it gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. Bill Dessler. Bill asked me to skip all the formal introductions, um, and so I'm going to cut right to the chase. Would you please give me a very warm welcome to our president, Dr. Bill Dessler. Well, first of all, welcome back to the beginning of another academic year. And I believe that the coming year will be one of the most important in the history of RIT for reasons that you are already aware of. Of course, our three-year journey to a semester calendar is finally at an end. And this year, we will find out what works and what doesn't, and we'll learn what we didn't think about at all. For all of the hard work, done by so many of you that have brought us to this point, I can only offer my heartfelt thanks. There will still be adjustments to be made once we gain experience with the semester calendar, of course, but I believe that we have laid a strong foundation that we can build upon in the years to come. And Genesis, our new student information system, is also up and running. 
And while this has been a challenging and frustrating exercise for many of you, you are, we are likewise in your debt for your hard work and your patience. I don't know if this project will ever really be finished, since complex information technology systems are almost always a work in progress. But again, your hard work has put us in a position to ultimately benefit from this transition. So again, to all of you who contributed to this immense project, heartfelt thanks. Now usually, I spend a good deal of my annual welcome back address reviewing our accomplishments during the past year. But this year, I decided to spend this brief period to talk on a more personal level about what's on the horizon and what we need collect to do collectively to sustain RIT's strong, positive momentum. Now, as you know, when I first joined the RIT family, I established a number of very specific goals around student application numbers, retention and graduation rates, fundraising and alumni engagement, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. And also, on the initiation of new academic programs, needed to fill out our curricular offerings. I did this because in many ways we were not performing in these areas at the level of the best private universities. And while these metrics do not by themselves define greatness, greatness cannot be achieved without competitive performance in these areas. And after six years, I am pleased to see that RIT has made real progress in all of these areas. And as a result, we are beginning to successfully compete for the best students, faculty, and staff. This is important because I believe that in the next year or so, RIT will move from being nationally ranked in the regional north category to the national university ranking category. Now, we actually don't get to choose which category we're ranked in. As soon as we begin to regularly produce 20 PhD degrees PhD degrees or more on an annual basis. Our Carnegie classification will change, and we will be ranked against the best colleges and universities in the nation and the world. Now, many of you know that I think college rankings are more of a problem than a solution, and that I think that they are, for the most part, trying to force very different colleges and universities through a single evaluation filter. Why North Carolina a and should be compared to Princeton is a mystery to me. But I know that we are going to be ranked by various print and online outlets, whether we like it or not. So we should at least be prepared for this change. So let's think about how we can turn this lemon into lemonade. And given all that, where do I think we should aspire to be ranked? Well, I truly believe that if we continue on our present path, a ranking in the top 100 universities and colleges in the US is a realistic goal. When you think about it, RIT wasn't even called RIT until 1949. We didn't offer bachelor degrees until 1954. We didn't produce our first master's degree until 1960. We didn't occupy the current campus until 1968. We didn't grant our first PhD degree until 1993. There are more than 4,000 colleges and universities in the US, and we could be ranked in the top 100. I guess that really would be lemonade. So what will it take to get there? We need to continue on our path to extend our geographic reach and our recruitment of those talented students, staff, and faculty. We must continue to grow our reputation as a place where innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship flourish. We must continue our efforts to diversify our student, faculty, and staff populations and exploit NTID's presence on our campus. We must continue to get RIT's name out across the country and around the world. We must continue to be seen as a place where students and their parents get a real return on their investment. And we must continue to be a place where the best and brightest come to find their futures. And let me give you a few examples of both the progress we have made and the challenges we have in front of us. Probably the one university with which we share the most undergraduate applicants is RPI. 20 years ago, 
Only a small fraction of RIT enrolled students would have even been offered admission to RPI. And 20 years ago, our chance of enrolling a student in competition with RIT were only about one out of three. But last year, we won almost half of these competitions. And just to remind you, RPI was ranked 41st in the last US News National University rankings. And we continue to attract an increasing number of truly exceptional students. One of our freshmen this year is only 13 years old. He's already completed two associate degrees at community colleges. And one of last year's freshman students, Adam Munich, well, there's a story to be told about Adam, and I think Adam's here. Adam, would you please stand up and be recognized? There he is. <laughs> Adam Munich has truly been a pain in the butt. <laughs> in his first year at RIT, he got into trouble for cracking our IT security systems just to show us how easy they were to break into. And he took on several self-directed engineering projects in our various labs and shops by mostly breaking our rules and borrowing material and equipment wherever he could find them, sometimes without asking. One of his projects was an advanced Tesla coil, which he wanted to demonstrate at Imagine RIT, but since it operated at over 10,000 volts, we told him he could not turn it on for safety reasons. I guess we showed him. Well, actually, he showed us. His Tesla coil, and Adam himself, won the NGBOS prize at the Texas Instruments Analog Design Contest and Summit including a $10,000 cash awards, and there were more than 400 entries from around the world. <laughs> and the awards panel at Texas Instruments was astonished at both the sophistication of his design and the innovation he showed in actually producing a working model. And they were even more astonished to learn that he was a freshman. Adam has quite honestly attributed a fair amount of success to his quiet circumvention of our various rules and regulations. <laughs> I think in the wake of this experience, we need to be willing to ask ourselves whether we are getting in the way of talented students like Adam or recognizing their potential and finding ways to support them. And as a result, I've asked Adam to work with us to help create a kind of student skunk works or hacker space or whatever we're going to call it that would support student-initiated and directed projects more effectively. And one of my goals for this year is to actually create such a space while ensuring a reasonable level of accountability and safety. <laughs> Frankly, as our students get better and better, these are the kinds of challenges we will confront in meeting their needs. So get used to it. As for national visibility, there are roles for all of us to play in this area. Last year, for example, our men's lacrosse team went all the way to the Division III national title game. And it is difficult to communicate the kind of pride that that kind of achievement engenders in RIT alumni and friends. And this year, our men's hockey team will play Michigan, and our women's hockey team will play Vermont during Brick City homecoming. Those are both state flagship institutions and national hockey powers and they are coming to RIT. We are not going there. We will not meet our goal unless we have a faculty renowned for their scholarship, creative activity, and pedagogical innovations. One example, of course, is uh, NTID professor Todd Pagano, who was named US Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation, one of only three to be accorded this honor. And our various academic departments and programs are increasingly appearing highly ranked in various national online and print media organizations. In fact, we have now about a dozen programs ranked in the top 10 nationally. Our organized student team activities, such as our wonderfully successful Formula SAE and Mini Baja teams, can also communicate the excitement of the RIT experience. And last year, a team of RIT students won the National Cyber Defense Competition. And these are just a few examples 
of how we are increasingly sending a national and international message about the emerging greatness of RIT. To reach our goal, we will need more of the same on a regular basis. And in the area of pedagogical leadership, we are being challenged as never before. Earlier this year, Georgia Tech announced an experimental MOOC-based online computer science master's degree for a total tuition cost of $8,000. Will this be the new model for higher education? And if so, how will we respond? Our new Innovative Learning Institute is organizing a variety of new online programs, but what the market will respond to in a positive way is still unknown. And we must remain both creative and flexible if we are to compete. And if we do not compete, we may be left at the starting gate. And while we take pride in the 95% placement rate among our graduates, we must continue to control costs and maintain access to an RIT education for students of modest means. Although our students are getting better year by year, many are still the first in their families to attend college, and many others require significant financial aid to attend. The days in which we could raise tuition and fees annually by two to three times the rate of inflation and expect to receive significant added revenues are over. One area in which there's an opportunity to control costs is in our health benefit programs. Now, I have no intention of reducing our health care benefit package in any way. But we are working with our alliance partner, the Rochester General Health System, to see if they can offer us a tiered health care plan that would be equal in quality and lower in cost than our current offerings. And if that is possible, that plan will be added as an option to our current offerings, and any savings in the new plan will be shared with our IT employees. In addition, we are working with Rochester General to open a walk-in clinic on our campus to serve students, faculty, and staff, and to serve as a training opportunity for our allied healthcare programs. And finally, I truly believe that RIT is poised to become a national leader in the education of a truly diverse student body. Recent support programs developed by our Multicultural Center for Academic Success for graduates of urban high schools, most of whom are African American or Latino, are already beginning to reduce the retention rate gap typically seen for such students compared to students from suburban backgrounds. And our Future Stewards program for Native American students is becoming a national model with retention and graduation rates for these students actually exceeding our campus average. And taken together with the remarkable success of NTID in moving deaf and hard of hearing students to meaningful careers, we have the chance to be a best practice educational institution in an area absolutely essential to the future success of our nation. All this and much more lies in front of us. And I am confident that the same collective efforts that have brought us to this point will continue to carry us forward in the years ahead. I cannot promise you that the hard work is over, but I can promise you that it will be worth it. Very few individuals have the opportunity to participate in the kind of transformation that RIT is undergoing. And that transformation if we continue to make the kind of progress we have been making, will be your legacy. Thanks so much for your hard work, your, your support, and your dedication to our students. I'm so proud to have the honor of serving as your president. Thank you very much.